The beauty about them is that they are fuel agnostic. You can feed them any sort of gaseous hydrocarbon or mixture thereof and they'll run. Talking to our battery expert who's now in the hydrogen center of excellence. And what a coincidence, Joby just had a record flight last week with hydrogen using the patents from H2Fly that they acquired two years ago. So Ash, great to have you here. And is hydrogen back? I think hydrogen is back and it's back in a careful manner. And that's actually good to see. Back in the days, everybody thought hydrogen would replace or be a suitable application for everything, including your lawnmower or your, your laptop. And these were kind of ridiculous applications, to be honest. We have to really focus on, on where hydrogen makes sense. And my motto is to actually avoid using hydrogen as much as possible, only when you have no other choice, then you can use hydrogen. And we've essentially, the world has been backed off in this corner and they've really assessed all the applications out there and they've come up with very few industries where it actually makes sense and they are zeroing in and focusing on these industries. And so that's very good to see. So what use cases are we talking about? Because looking at cars, uh, the Mirai from Toyota doesn't look like it's uh, a success in the market. What kind of applications are you seeing in your center of excellence right now? So we're seeing a lot of industrial applications to begin with. And these are very hard sectors to decarbonize. So looking at gasoline refining, synthetic fuels, so making sustainable aviation fuel, for example, or synthetic ammonia, or they call it green ammonia. And these are applications where energy storage devices or batteries just cannot fulfill because you need an actual molecule. So we call it the molecules business. And to add to that, the shipping industry is also heavily investigating ammonia and methanol as well. So these are very exciting applications where there is demand for it. The customer is getting close to their ability to pay for it as well. On the smaller side, on the lighter side, we're still focusing on applications where batteries cannot compete. So the heavier the application and the more heavy duty the application, the better hydrogen is. So we're talking aviation, we're talking trains, we're talking ships. We're still actually pretty good for heavy duty trucking. So batteries haven't conquered that sector of the transportation economy yet. Yeah, and looking at the Joby S4, I mean, that is a very light plane. So how does that fit into this idea of that hydrogen is more suitable for larger, heavy transportation systems? Well, it comes down to weight, right? In the aviation sector, weight is everything. So if you're carrying a lot of batteries, and if we take the best in class, energy density or the correct term being gravimetric energy density or specific energy. We're looking at, you know, 250 watt hours per kilogram. So that's a lot of weight for the amount of energy that you're getting out of. It. And hydrogen is not even on the same scale. By itself, hydrogen is already providing 33.3 kilowatt hours per kilogram. So not, not even watt hours, kilowatt hours. Now we have to be realistic. We have to look into the entire system. So hydrogen is stored in tanks, in gaseous tanks. It's only about five to 6%. That's actually the hydrogen one. But even then, the available energy density is higher than batteries. And so hydrogen is on the, on the kilowatt hour scale, whereas batteries are still on the watt hour scale. And that's what enables hydrogen fueled aviation. And where does hydrogen sit between these weight factors that you mentioned? You've got the battery, the weight always remains the same. And then you've got your normal jet fuel uh, where you lose weight, the plane becomes more efficient. The further you travel, the more fuel you burn. Where does hydrogen sit in between with the tank, with the electrolyzer, transform the hydrogen into electricity? So two parts to your questions here. First of all, in terms of weight as the fuel is being depleted. So in a normal jet fuel scenario, you lose the majority of the fuel weight as the plane consumes fuel. In hydrogen, it's only about 15% or so. So 15% of the weight of the tank is actually usable hydrogen. And so from a full tank to an empty tank, you're only playing the weight by about 15%. So it's not as effective as a normal jet fuel. Now, on the other hand, the entire value chain or the entire energy chain of making hydrogen and then using hydrogen, the efficiency is actually pretty terrible. So you're starting with, let's say, 100 kilowatt hours of energy. Your electrolyzers are about 75% efficient. You're storing it. That costs an additional 11 kilowatt hours per kilogram of hydrogen. And now you're running into a fuel cell. So average efficiency, let's say, is about 50%. The reason why we're still going ahead with with it. It's just because there's no other alternative to doing this. The only other alternative is to use that hydrogen and then make sustainable aviation fuel. It's a pretty neat concept. You use carbon dioxide, you use hydrogen, you synthesize this and you make actual jet fuel, but synthetic jet fuel. But then you're putting one more step into the process. And so now your round trip efficiency is even less than 15%. So we'd rather go with something that has, you know, a 
25 to 30% round trip efficiency rather than something that's less. Both are terrible options. We just have to choose the least terrible out of the options that we have. Yeah, and I mean, talking about hydrogen as a source, uh, there are different ways, of course, of producing hydrogen. So you've got blue hydrogen, purple, gray, green, when it's from solar, for example. You can produce it from coal, from gas. So uh, that, of course, then is a good for aviation, Joby as for flying without emissions during the flight. But the question then is, how is the hydrogen being produced? What kind of emissions do you have along the supply chain? Right now, the fuel cell on board that aircraft doesn't really care where that hydrogen is coming from, as long as it meets the purity requirements. And so in the trial phase, I don't think it's an issue to use hydrogen wherever you can source it. If it is to become adopted, and if you are to claim that your flight is emissions free or lower emissions, or that you're using green hydrogen, then you need to abide by certain specific rules uh, in terms of carbon intensity for producing these fuels. These are not entirely 100% clear yet. The rules are still being finalized as to what constitutes green hydrogen, because even a 100% renewable energy grid has some emissions. So once these rules are out, uh, we'll be able to clearly define what is green hydrogen. But otherwise, on the other colors, we do have pretty clear definition. There's also a new entrance into the market. So we're seeing a lot of what we called gold hydrogen or orange hydrogen. So that's hydrogen being mined from underground. It's a new part of the value chain that we haven't really studied or explored yet. And what about prices of hydrogen now in, in North America? I mean, I remember back in the hype 2021, when I was also invested in hydrogen, we we're talking about $4 per kilogram. Do you have any visibility of what's happening right now on the price side? So the price can vary at small scales. You're producing it and selling it for above $8 a kilogram. Most refueling stations right now are offering hydrogen at 700 bar. In Canada, it's about $12 a kilogram. It is subsidized though. In California, it's uh, above $14. I think it reached a peak of over $33 a kilogram. Now, if we're producing it at large scale with the incentives that the U.S. provides, so the U.S says, if you meet certain rules, they're called the 45V rules, we're going to give you $3 a kilogram as incentives. So if, you, if your facility is optimized enough, well-engineered, large scale, let's say you're able to produce it for 5 or $6 a kilogram, and you get the $3 per kilogram incentives, then you're effectively in the 2 to $3 per kilogram. And that's actually where it starts to become very competitive. It starts to reach parity with diesel, with jet fuel. It makes the business case possible. So we haven't quite seen such large-scale plant come into to commercial operation, but they're getting very close. So this is definitely a, a long-term bet for Joby on the future, moving into uh, beyond inner city travel to intercity travel. So from ultra short haul to the short haul business, hence also, of course, increasing the total addressable market, which is uh, super for their business case. But as you just stated, we still have to see the supply chain, the industry develop, and that's going to hopefully happen over the next few coming years. Yeah, and, and they need each other, actually. So the, the actual chemical plants, those commercial plants need offtake agreements in order to, to justify their business case and to essentially de-risk their projects from lenders. And so if Joe we can provide clear, consistent offtake agreements for hydrogen, then that makes the entire business case and supply chain easier to, to create. Talking about the economics, you will have routes where you're only allowed to fly if you are emission free and if you're meeting a certain noise threshold, which in Joby's case will be uh, below 50 decibels. So that's definitely going to make a difference for them being able to access certain routes that are not accessible as of today by a helicopter. So definitely some good business there for them. Yeah, we, we have to keep watching it. It's very encouraging to see Joby's progress. We're looking forward to uh, not only meeting that record range that they achieve, but if they can do it consistently over and over again and prove that there's reasonable margins of safety within that aircraft, then it's looking promising. We talked about batteries versus fuel cells and um, in batteries, of course, we have a degradation. Um, you only have X amount of load cycles. So how does that compare to a fuel cell? Do you also have a degradation? How many miles can you fly until you need to also replace your fuel cell? Excellent question. So. Fuel cells actually are, are measured by operational hours. The minimum operational hour in the industry right now is about 5,000 hours for a stack. Uh, and that's quite low, but that's at the ground level. So it's considering the fact that you have particulates contaminants, you have carbon monoxide, and carbon monoxide is a main poison. We've seen some really good improvements in the recent years. So the longest fuel cell that has been in commercial operation has reached 25,000 hours, and that's really good. More and more companies are coming up 
to the 10,000, 15,000, 20,000 hour mark. And that's really promising. Just to put that into context, I mean, if we look at the normal Cessna airframe, we've got 20,000 hours of flying there for the airframe. So for a Joby S4 to fly 20,000 hours in aviation, that's already a good benchmark. That's already a good benchmark. And I think there's something even better that Joby isn't uh, capitalizing on is that when you're flying at higher altitudes, the concentration of contaminants goes down. So the concentration of CO, carbon monoxide in the air is lower. And so they should technically experience slower degradation when flying at higher altitudes versus when flying near ground level. So that's something that interesting that Joby can, can study, they can research and publish. That makes a business case for essentially having the fuel cell itself lasting, like you said, as long as the airframe. And so you don't need an overhaul throughout the life cycle of the, the aircraft. And uh, talking about fuel cells, as, a, as I'm not familiar with the technical details, do you have similar grades of efficiency like you have with the heat pump of how much kilowatt you convert per kilogram of hydrogen? Or is, 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 is that always kind of standard because of a chemical process in the fuel cell? These are two very different things. So heat pumps, they essentially concentrate heat from a, an, a low grade unusable source to a more high grade concentrated form of heat. Fuel cells convert essentially stored energy in bonds and chemical bonds into electricity. And right now we're pretty much near the limit of what we can achieve unless we increase temperatures. And so low temperature fuel cells, which are known as PEM fuel cells, right now have a range of between 40 to 60 percent uh, conversion efficiency. However, the next generation of high temperature fuel cells, they could technically reach over 80 to 90 percent efficiencies. That will be interesting to see if, you know, if that can be properly packaged to be in an aviation airframe and if they car, if, if it's feasible to put it, you know, in the air and maintain such high temperatures, but that's the next step. So if, if high temperature fuel cells become robust enough for aviation, then Joby Aviation's range may increase again or, or any sort of hydrogen based aircraft with fuel cells. So pretty exciting to see the advancements in high temperature technology. And uh, do you have any roadmap? I mean, are we talking about five years or is it similar to the solid state battery from Toyota that is uh, going to be launched next year, uh, but that's already been announced for the last 15 years. Uh, no, no, it's already here. So solid uh, high temperature fuel cells have been operating with natural gas for a long time. The beauty about them is that they are fuel agnostic. You can feed them any sort of gaseous hydrocarbon or mixture thereof and they'll run. Very few applications have run them on pure hydrogen. And so we need to confirm that, you know, they can run effectively on pure hydrogen with maybe some modifications and that it can be packaged appropriately for an aviation application and then they'll be up there in the air. And as a final thought, there's also a big PR aspect to hydrogen. Even your favorite band is into hydrogen, so I heard. Yeah, I think I think there's a market for it already and we can make an impact. We can use them positively, right? So the, the private jet business can make use of EV tolls, the billionaires and the celebrities. We've all seen the backlash that uh, Taylor Swift received on social media for flying so much between uh, football games for her boyfriend. She could use an EV toll and make a positive spin out of this to raise awareness that technology is usable and available. My favorite band as well, Metallica, recently announced that they're touring with hydrogen fuel cell trucks, so zero emission trucking for their concert tours. And that made me so proud. That made me so happy. So now I'm, I'm listening to even more Metallica out there to support them. <laughs>